Hello, this is Georgina Rose. This is Nike. This is Anthony. And welcome to Magnolias and Magic. In this episode, we're going to be talking about a deeply important spiritual topic that you've probably heard a little bit of discussion about, but that we wanted to go into great depth in because it's really, really important. And that would be spiritual hygiene. So even if you're the most beginner occultist out there, you're probably going to have been told to cleanse your space. Even if you're in the mainstream spiritual technique, the idea of walking around your house with an herb bundle burning has become a popular idea as something that can cleanse out your apartment. But spiritual hygiene can go a lot deeper, and there's reasons you need to do it. So we all sort of understand about the energies, but it can get really, you know, comprehensive and complex. So we're going to be talking about what it is, forms of it, and yes, there is more than burning things, uh, the benefits, the basics, cleansing, consecrating, banishing, warding, and even working with specific spirits and k- dealing with spiritual presences in your home. Because as someone who sort of used to deal with that, I think it can be really helpful to discuss how to get that shit out. Because you're probably going to want that shit gone. Uh, and then our own sort of personal spiritual hygiene practices and everything related to that. So let's break into it. So spiritual hygiene the cleanest way to define it, we're not using a dictionary, we're just sort of using our own thoughts, um, would be the act of keeping your space, yourself, your microcosm, and your macrocosm cleansed and purified. So in a lot of older school rituals, uh, let's think the Abram Ellen, let's think old school mysticism, a really important thing before actually doing any workings was to purify, to cleanse. These were typically done through very long and exhaustive procedures. The abramelon in particular makes you abstain from sex, eat only a very specific diet, uh, not work, not use technology, not engage socially with people for months at a time on top of a strict prayer regimen to even be prepared to start practicing magic. Obviously, most traditions don't have that level of intensity, but you can see in many practices the idea of doing sort of acts and things to cleanse, right? In the new age spaces, you see things like burning herbs before you set your intentions. In common witchcraft spaces, you see things like doing washing your floors with various herbs, smoking, smoke cleansing your apartment. There are a couple of different ways to do that. Um, even stuff like physically cleaning your home. This may sound a little silly, But clean your room. Look, there was this big debate on Witch Talk, which we all know how I feel about that hell app. Anyways, there was a big debate on whether or not your windows should be open or closed while smoke cleansing. And I remember my response to this was, well, is your space clean? Because that cleansing isn't going to do shit if your space is cluttered. Because as we understand, a common occult principle is the idea of as above, so below. Or how I like to phrase it because I'm a nerd, the microcosm and the macrocosm. So we understand that our small space reflects into our larger space. And so your room and how it looks is a microcosm of your mind. Your mind has that as above, so below relationship with your space. We all know that it feels really relieving to clean a dirty room once you're done, of course. And that is actually a spiritual thing. And so it's really important to literally clean your space. Like if you have an altar in your home... Since that is a place for the divine, you probably want to keep that clean. And then for, you know, specific things, you can get really intensive. Like, say you're working with spirits, you need to learn how to banish to cleanse. And so spiritual cleansing, spiritual hygiene, your hygiene is just the level of cleanliness you have. Just like your physical hygiene. Uh, so let's let's move into, like, ways it can be done. Like, what are some common ways you see spiritual hygiene maintained? What are sort of the basic things that everyone should be aware of and have their foundations understood about? I mean, you already touched on it. Uh, I'll I'll just give a personal example. Anytime I'm going to do any form of ritual, I clean my room at least a little bit. Uh, If the altar space has a lot of incense dust on it, I'll clean that up. If I've got clothes all over the floor, like I'm not going to feel very magical if I turn around to, you know, call the quarters or whatever I might be doing for any particular ritual or whatever. And I just see my dirty laundry on the floor. Like at minimum, (laughs) I got to put it away in the closet. Like I don't want it in sight because, you know, if you come home from a long day at work and your house is a mess, you're going to feel kind of bad. Versus if it's already clean when you get home, it feels way better and you can just relax and not worry about it. So I always do that. 
But I, I would argue maybe more importantly than that is cleaning your actual physical body, not even in like a spiritual bath kind of way, but just like take a bath, take a shower, because it's also I don't like to feel grimy and gross if I haven't showered and I'm going into ritual. A lot of traditions will have you wash at least your hands, if not your whole body before you say enter a temple or before you do some form of working like you're supposed to physically wash yourself like this is a very important concept and so spiritually it translates why my, my confusion has always been why do you think that only the metaphysical is necessary if you know that in spell work the physical elements are important like if you're adding herbs and crystals and candles and whatever and the correspondences need to be this and that why would you not correspond your physical body being clean with your spirit being clean I, i've never understood that kind of disconnect between you as a, a spiritual creature and your spell work and why there's not the connection between the physical and the metaphysical just smoke cleansing your space is not going to clean it yeah um the actual the thing about washing your hands and stuff it's a very specific idea in some early forms of abrahamic mysticism that before even praying you're supposed to wash your hands and your feet mm -hmm. um and sometimes even your face so cleaning like the sort of the external is really it there's a long tradition to it um in a lot of folk practices for certain rituals there's this idea of like doing specific baths with herbs um where you take like herbs that are cleansing i have a jar of random like cleansing herbs together in my bathroom and what i'll do is i will get into my bath i'll fill it up and I will do prayers and mantras or whatever. And literally, like, kind of like you're baptizing a baby, like, throw it over my head, right? Like, cover my head, submerge everything in my body, and then sit in the tub while it drains down. So it fully leaves and all that gross shit goes down the drain. And then I get out and dry myself. And then I do my rituals. Because of this, I tend to do my rituals later in the day or at night. Um, and I'll, like, sh like, take my bath, like, right around sundown. Uh, though that gets a little tricky in the winter when it gets dark super early here. But yeah, like this idea of the physical is a long-standing thing. A lot of traditions as well will have people wear white for specific initiatory rituals or are leading up to them, mm -hmm. sometimes even for extended periods of time, because that is the color of sort of that purity, that cleansly cleanliness. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the line between cleansing and purification especially if you're talking about ceremonial magic, it gets really blurry. Um, I think cleansing is like doing a physical thing, whereas purification is sort of abstaining from stuff. But to be honest, those definitions can get really, you know what I mean? Like they can get really sort of mingled together. And so I think sometimes it's useful to see these things as like, you know, not necessarily separate parts, but as things that overlap and sort of exchange with each other. Mm -hmm. well, I think a big part of it is like the intention you bring into it of like what you're trying to achieve, like by the end of whatever ritual you're doing, because like, like two uh, big systems that influence me as far as like spiritual hygiene are like um, in Hellenism, it's very common that you're supposed to bathe yourself and like perform this entire like cleansing ritual before you do any form of like, uh, like devotional work with like a deity. And like that part it's interesting because like we're talking about this duality of like the physical and the spiritual it was kind of that duality like intentionally like uh you would perform like a physical cleansing on your body and the space that you're working in but you would also cleanse yourself of this concept called miasma which is like this like emotional like to you to use a really bad word to describe it like karmaic like baggage that you're carrying around with you like all of this like like any bad deeds you had done or any bad people you had been around or like if someone in your community had done something to like piss off the gods like any of this bad energy you accumulated around yourself you'd perform a cleansing ritual to clean yourself physically and then also to dispel like all of that before you approach deity and then like the flip side of that is like a different way to approach it um i draw a lot from like not atr specifically but like this is very prevalent in atrs but i draw more from like santeria and like more like mexican-based folk practices but like um like floor washes are super like a very very popular form of cleansing in those systems and like uh what's the other one like herbal baths but like the idea with that is like you literally combine the cleansing process with like a physical process of like like for a floor wash you pour like your herbal concoction into like your 
mop water basically and like wash your floors with that or like a ritual bath you combine it with like your little bath water and then like cleanse yourself while you're taking a bath and it's like that dual perspective of like trying like you guys are saying trying to use the physical act of cleaning something in order to cleanse it spiritually but like within those systems like you can have whatever intention you want going into that process like i know at least within atrs and like within santeria and stuff like that there's a billion types of floor washes or like a billion different types of herbal baths you can take like people use that to treat like certain types of physical and like medical ailments people use it to treat like if your emotions are all over the place or like if you're dealing with grief or if you're heartbroken or like literally anything they uh, it's a very common belief that like you can use cleansing processes to take care of like any number of those problems and so like for me it really does come down to like what kind of intention you're trying to bring into the cleansing process this actually came up in a class I took with Jason Miller. Um, it was a class about exorcism. And he was talking about one of the things that you would do before the actual exorcism itself is uh, purification. Like you need to have yeah. yourself be purified, not just the space. And of course you do the space. But I mean, some of the, because I have, I have my notes open from it. Some of the things that he would recommend are exactly what we've been saying, but his suggestions are both outer and inner purification. So there's mm -hmm. uh, baths, celibacy, fasting, uh, but there's also like the the spiritual things you would do as well. So are our, our, what we would think about as cleansing and things like that. Um, you know, taking the Eucharist being one of a meditation, like making yourself spiritually clean and physically clean. Like you would do these in combination. Maybe you do a, a, a large amount of these. So maybe you would take a bath, be celibate, and then fast the night before. And you would also do these other spiritual purifications. Like the the mixing of them is very important. That's for one of the the really strong things that are out there is exorcism you know that's that's mm -hmm. going to be really important to have that purification so you know for big or small it's important to do these things maybe you don't need to be as intense about it for you know say a self-love spell but i think that the purification element would still be important to you because if you've still got some of this ick and emotional baggage that clings to your spirit if you're able to uh wash away some of that and make it easier to get off the rest of the way with whatever you're doing wouldn't you want to give yourself every advantage right Mm -hmm, exactly. Yeah, and I think we're touching a little bit on when you were describing things like the exorcism, like celibacy, fasting, those are um, monastic asceticism, which is like the idea of withdrawing, rejecting the material and cleansing in that way. And I want to give some notes on that because um, it's, it's something that people tend to have weird relationships with. Some people are really, really into it and some people are very averse to it because they think it means some sort of long-term commitment, especially when like the topic of celibacy comes up because a lot of people have baggage with that. Um, and I was talking to someone about this and they're like, I feel really weird about abstaining from sex. Do you mean like abstaining from sex until marriage? Do you mean giving it up entirely? And I'm like, no, I mean a periodic withdrawal to purify prior ritual and then commonly after the ritual. And you see this a lot in Thelema in particular, which is my practice. People will fast and abstain from sex for a few days. And then at the end of the ritual, you feast. And mm -hmm. when you feast, you're allowed to eat food fill yourself up and have a good time if you catch my drift. This idea of like you withdraw and then you do the ritual and then you celebrate is a very common theme. So if you're fasting, uh, first of all, fasting is something you have to be very, very careful with. There are certain people who I would not advise fast for medical reasons or if you have a history with certain conditions. Um, but when you fast, you typically don't fast for that long. It's typically fasting for like a day from morning until sundown, and then you do the ritual right after sundown, and then afterwards you make all your food and your feast and it's great, right? Like fasting is broken. It's not like long-term forever. There are some traditions that really do embrace monastic asceticism in this very hard line way. You know, like monks mm -hmm. is of course the obvious example, but you know, it's, it's not as intimidating as people think it is. Um, as well, if you're someone who can't fast for medical reasons, something that I really like to do is digital fasting, where I will get rid of all my technology. And there's some precedent for this. Um, the idea of like taking a Sabbath or whatever, where you like withdraw from everything, stay in your home, turn all the lights out and don't work has precedent in history. Mm -hmm. And so things like that can actually be just as valid, like give up electricity until your ritual and just mm -hmm. spend the day kind of pondering and reflecting. Things like that work just as well. Um, and there are sort of some, you know, monastic asceticism is something that can be really easy. Like, say you wear white until a ritual or you give mm -hmm. up, you go vegan for a day, right? Things like that. Because mm -hmm. giving up meat is not uncommon. Like, um, the Abramelon in particular has you live off rice and bread and, like, not meat. 
um, Mm -hmm. you know, stuff like that. Like those are really great ways to do it without going as hard. But if you want to go really hard into monastic asceticism, there's like whole types of mysticism in particular that are based around this idea of Mm -hmm. purification, withdrawal, um, rejecting the material for the divine. Like there's, there's whole, whole schools of practice around it, but it doesn't need to be scary, right? You can literally (laughs) just not eat meat for a day. You know, uh, you can make it really easy. It's It doesn't need to be scary. Monastic asceticism does not mean you have to fast every day of your life and retreat from society and self-flagellate for three hours a day, okay? <laughs> does not have to look that scary. Uh, I'm curious, like, at least within Thelema, like, do you have more info on, like, what specifically, like, what purpose that serves, like, spiritually, like, or, like, ritualistically, or however that would be? Because, like, everything you're describing, it's reminding me a lot of, like, um, a lot of initiation types of purification that I've heard from, again, like, ATRs, or, like, specifically Santeria, um, like, of, of this is not like a universal process, but it's pretty common where like the first time you initiate into one of those uh, religious paradigms, you spend about a time period of like a year following like all of these different types of abstinences. And like the very common ones are like, you have to always wear white whenever you go out in public or like whenever you go out in public, you have to be accompanied by like your spiritual teacher. Like you're not allowed to eat spicy food. You're not allowed to drink alcohol. You're not allowed to have sex, like all of these different things. And at least within, I, I can can't speak for the other ATRs, but within Santeria, I know the basis for that is it's meant to serve as like, um, like you're being reborn into the uh, religion because it's like an initiation ritual. And so the idea is that you're becoming like a spiritual child again. And like, you're subjecting yourself to all of these very like, um, like, what's the word that I've heard used before? Just basically like non-invasive, like not crazy, not chaotic, like just these very like neutral, very like pure, I guess you could say like energies, like you're surrounding yourself in like this embryonic state of like pure energies. And then the idea is that after that, you are reborn and able to like, it's like a blank canvas. Like you're allowed to imprint all of the spiritual wisdom that you learn in the religion onto that because you've been purified. So like within Thelema, I have no idea if that's similar, but like, do you know the spiritual basis behind that? Yeah, so Thelema has a a few ways that we think ritual is sort of supposed to work. And one of the big ideas is that Thelema kind of, the Thelemic rituals kind of follow this pattern that Crowley really believed in. Mm -hmm. So you purify, you cleanse, then you do, well, it's, it's, no, I fucked that up. (laughs) Repeat. You purify you consecrate, you invoke. And that's sort of the formula that Thelemic rituals tend to follow, right? Okay. Purify, go through some sort of purification process, typically some sort of aestheticism, you see. Mm -hmm. And then, like, the white thing comes up quite a bit. Um, Crowley, when he did the big uh, invocation of Horus, he wore all white. uh, Because white's associated with purity, because we pull a lot from these, like, kind of Abrahamic-y ideas with like the white is purity. He wore like a headscarf during it, like stuff like that. And Mm -hmm. then you consecrate your tools. This is very important. Typically through like running incense and water over things. Like, you know how if you're at a Wiccan ceremony, they'll like make everyone touch the candle and then the waterer and then the oil and that type of stuff. Yeah. Then you do the big invocations and evocations after that. And then when you're done, you feast and you have catharsis, basically. They don't typically use the word catharsis. It's how it sort of processes in my mind. It's withdrawal, That's a really good word. the ritual, catharsis is sort of the thalamic formulation. Um, even if it's a ritual that's a little bit more uh, physical mm-hmm. or, you know, darker, it's still the same kind of formula. You always do something to prepare. Um, then you sort of get into headspace. You consecrate your tools. You set up your space. You, you know, make it your microcosm, right? You set it as yeah. your microcosm. And then you do the big shit. And then afterwards, you breathe. You live your life. Uh, if you're in a filmic group, everyone, like, has a good time or they, like, go out for drinks or food and stuff like that. Like, you. That sounds, like, a- so much fun. Oh, my God. It's a good cycle. I find that it really works. Um, mm-hmm. And you can apply it outside of a filmic context. It's pretty much all of Crowley's rituals and stuff follow this formula. Mm-hmm. Um he gets very technical into why he thinks it works. I think it just kind of logically makes sense, right? You yeah. prepare for the ritual, typically for a day or two. You do the thing, and then you enjoy your evening. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. I think that there is a a bit of 
I guess we could call it religious trauma associated with sometimes the word like pure or purification. Because yes. we're used to the Christian version of it yeah. and the uh, mm-hmm. sort of like you must be pure before marriage celibacy kind of idea. But I mean, mm-hmm. if you think about it, if you just take some of those Christian ideas, the, the like mainstream Christian ideas of uh, abstinence and celibacy on the whole, I mean, what you're abstaining from and for, like why you're abstaining from things, like one, yes, it says not to do this or that, but it's because marriage in a sense is a very large ritual because you're dedicating yourself to your marriage partner and to God in that large ritual. And so it's just a very long term, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, abstinence from these things. Yeah. I mean, you know, think, think about like giving up something for Lent or, or whatever, you know, you're, you're giving this up for the new year. It's just trying to build yourself a better life. Now the reasoning may change depending on what your tradition is, but I mean, I, I think that those abstinence principles, not in the way that they are invoked in Christianity, but just the ideas in general, we can look to some of the mainstream ways and just parse them down for a pagan way because mm-hmm. most pagan religions do not necessarily tell you that you can't have sex before marriage. It's a very fairly Christian Abrahamic kind of idea. Um, I don't know if it's present in Judaism, but I think it is in Islam. I could it's be wrong. pretty pretty clear that's what they want you to do in Judaism. Okay, mm-hmm. yeah. So so outside of Abrahamic context, uh, you know, pagan paganism really doesn't have any documents compelling us to do so, but you do see other things of like you don't partake in this or that. I mean, just the word breakfast, breaking fast. Fasting is a very common one. You you even see fasting in certain religions still today, like Islam. You you see fasting exist in a religious context where it's not forever and it's not even like over the course of a full day. It's just during daylight hours. Uh, mm-hmm. So so you see some of these things in, in a religious spiritual context still. And so we can take it that way. You know, if you are preparing for a ritual in the morning, you know, if you're if you're planning it out for that time, maybe you just don't eat beforehand, right? You mm-hmm. just don't eat breakfast before you do it. That mm-hmm. that's that's it. It's very easy. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I mean in Thelema, like we sometimes like certain rituals, you'll abstain from sex for like a few days. But we're a very pro-sex religion, right? Mm-hmm. I I had I had this thought today. I was like, cursed religious horseshoe theory is that both Catholics and Thelemites actually believe that sex is a replication of the divine process, and mm-hmm. thus is an act of magic and is very important. This is true, but it's framed very differently. Yep. Yeah. But it is fundamentally, I mean, that's a parallel, actually. Like, that's a pretty strong ideological parallel. We don't mm-hmm. have any of these ideas about, you know, waiting for marriage or anything. Um, mm-hmm. But you can have these things where you'll abstain from sex for, like, three days. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there's, it can be very, very toned down, and you can take influence. And in general, I find that this idea that pa- that occultism and Christianity or paganism and Christianity are, like, some sort of hardline dichotomy I, I don't think it's very true. It's not historically true. Because, mm-hmm. like, when the Christians converted Europe, they kept a lot of pagan traditions in. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't see why we can't take from them. Mm-hmm. Like, they're open traditions. I mean, I don't see why we can't borrow ideas. I don't think there's really anything wrong with it. So, I mean, if we see that there's some good ideas over there, why not? Mm-hmm. Why not incorporate it? Which then again, I mean, I'm part of Thelema, which is a deeply syncretic system. We take some Abrahamic ideas. Uh, for instance, we have very emanatory Platonic cosmology, which is more of a originally vaguely quasi Abrahamic idea. But like, we interpret it in a very heretical way. But I don't see why we can't take influence from them. To be honest, like, why not? Mm-hmm. Like there, I think that it's pretty arrogant to assume that only our very narrow path is the only one that's ever had a good idea, mm-hmm. right? I think there is, and maybe this is a little perennialist of me to say, I think there is a lot of wisdom in all these paths. And I think that all these religions, we're on to something, right? Like mm-hmm. clearly if it's worked for enough people, there's some value to it. There's not value to all of it. Certainly not. I'm not a Christian for a reason. But I think that we can take from them. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, no, I, I, I like agree. frankincense and sense, okay? <laughs> it smells good. <laughs> That's so fucking funny. Yeah, no, I completely agree that I probably am always going to be a syncretist at heart. But, like, as far as, like, the... It's funny you bring that up because, like, a lot of the principles that I personally have, like, a lot of my UPG about how all of this stuff, like spiritual hygiene works, has a lot to do with actual, like, my background in Catholicism. Because, like, in Catholicism, like, the whole idea is, like, 
like you, you brought up like the Nike, you brought up the purity thing. Like uh, the whole idea in Christianity is like you're impure if you have been exposed to sin or like if you've committed sin and that can take like a billion different forms. But like historically, if you go back and actually look at like what the definition of sin originally was, it was meant to be anything that separates you from your connection to God. And like that's where that like original concept comes from. And I don't remember like historic like the Christians didn't come up with it. This is from some other culture. It was probably the Greeks or the Romans or something. But within that, like I find there to be a lot of wisdom within that actually, because like my entire practice is very based around like my connection to the divine. And so like if something does come like in between that, like that is a problem. Like if I get like there was a period of time where I was very addicted to opioids, like when I was a teenager, that was a problem. It was getting in the way of a lot of things, including my spiritual practice. And like I'm not so going the extra mile to say like that's a sin, but like that that could be a problem that I need to look at. Like anything that is inhibiting specifically my connection to like my spirituality or to my craft or like to the divinity within me or the divinity without me. Like if something is fucking up that process, that's something that needs to be cleansed. And like those are the things that I will then go in and examine. And like that is a piece of wisdom that I've taken from Christianity. So like yeah, no, I'm very syncretist in that way. I actually find that really interesting because um we have this, th there's a famous quote by Crowley on sin, where he says, the word of sin is restriction, which I think is kind of true if you look at the like old school Christian view, but I kind of disagree with it because in a way in Thelema, the most important thing is that you're always following your true will, which a lot of right. people think that means you can do what you want, but that's actually a really restrictive thing. That means in every second of every day, every single choice you make should be leading to your true will. Mm -hmm. Like, let's say it's even something as small as like what you're eating. Are you eating something that purifies, that like, empowers your body and lets you do your will later that day or are you eating something that's slowing you down like even stuff like that you can think of as going against your will so exactly. that's actually kind of a sin like concept in a very weird way mm -hmm. so you can in a sense argue that you can sin as a thelemite because when you sin sin is whenever you make a your... choice yeah when you consciously make a choice that you know is against your true will Mm -hmm. But you choose to do it anyways, even though it's going to be worse for you in the long run because you're moving away from divinity. So in a sense, like, I I disagree that sin is necessarily restriction. Yeah. But I think sin, in a sense, very much exists even within my own tradition. Though, of yeah. course, we don't think you're going to fucking go to Helima. Yeah, that, that's you where the hard line is. <laughs> I, yeah, do I, this, I do the, the concept of abstinence from certain things regularly. Uh when i can feel myself being impacted like i recently just announced like i'm going to be spending less time on twitter and i'm going to be less interactive because mm -hmm. it was making me deeply unhappy and i was focusing way more on what was happening in the community versus my own practice and my practice making me happy so yeah. i was like clearly this isn't working it's a big stressor i'm just gonna cut out a large part of it and I, I didn't abstain for all of it but i abstained from engaging in a lot of things i've done that previously um with certain parts of the news cycle like if it, it, I, I start to get very fatalistic where i'm just like the world is shit and everything's bad and nothing's changing and it just it makes me incredibly unhappy to be yeah. watching every single bad thing that is happening now i still try to stay tuned in enough politically to understand what's going on and to be aware and to be growing and, and changing with the times and, and keeping updated on things that you know any community that i want to support uh is asking of us but i also can't be tuned in to every political issue i don't stay mm -hmm. as tuned in to say the gun debate or uh you know some of that a lot of the presidential stuff i had to just tune out of because i knew what my vote was going to be already and i didn't feel that it was helpful for me to be constantly engaging in stuff that made me so unhappy like georgina talking about um abstaining from online stuff you know I'll, I'll abstain from the internet for a day or two if i really have to i'll veg out and just not interact and be like i need some time away i need some time off i'm gonna do it and it, it really helps so being able to take mm -hmm. even just like six hours off, I'll do that. Mm -hmm. No, no I, I that shit can drain you. Mm -hmm. And you want to be like fully present during a ritual. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like one of the most important things during a ritual, even a small spell is focus because to direct that energy, especially if you're dealing with spirits and stuff, like you don't want to be at a goetic and evocation and thinking about your grocery list. Yeah, You know, you have to be able to focus. And a lot of something I've noticed is a lot of this purification stuff helps with focus. Mm -hmm. Like, even beyond the spiritual value of them, like, being away from the, the shithole that is Twitter or 
or, you know, not eating processed foods or, Mm -hmm. you know, putting the vibrator in the drawer for a day. Like, (laughs) it can make you more focused and Mm -hmm. then help in that actual ritual. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I remember when I was new, I was always, I was reading, like, the few pagan books I could find where I was, like, at the public library, which, you know, not the highest quality books in the world. But all of them would say you need to meditate before you do anything. And I've stuck with that. I think that that's really good advice. Mm-hmm. Like, even for just a couple minutes, like, clear your head. Mm-hmm. You know, stuff like that. It, it really, really helps. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, so, like, within that... um that intentionality is something that at least for the meditation, like a lot of people I've seen this debate a lot on Twitter where like people get really hung up, especially on the meditation thing, because like they think that it's just like some ambiguous criteria to like being a witch or like to practicing like pagan spirituality. But like going with what you said with the theory, like the theory behind that is exactly like everything else we're talking about. It's to cleanse your space, to cleanse your mind and to make you prepared to go into that ritual. And like for every individual person that might look like something different. And it just so happens that meditation is a really not universal, but a very popular way of doing that. And so like, Again, I guess going back to the syncretism, like use what works for you, but like understand the theory behind why you're doing it. Like the point is to like we've been saying, like cleanse yourself and prepare yourself to go into the spiritual practice. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what happens when a spirit is in your house and banishing, because I think it's an adjacent topic to this. So if you've spent any time in an occult online community, You've seen a post that goes like this, and I'll be doing a beautiful impression. And I can see Nike looking stressed, but I'm gonna do it anyways. Hello, I am a new witch, and there is a spirit in my house. They have broken three of my glasses, and they are scaring me right now. I am currently posting this from my bathroom. I am crying, what do I do? The commenters, the, the com- yeah, you do the commenter. It ban it, banish it. Well, I don't want to be mean. I don't want to hurt the spirit's feelings. That seems kind of rude. I'm gonna jump into lava in Minecraft. Okay, but we have all seen this conversation. Someone posts this like yeah. really dramatic like post about how they're really scared, and then someone will be like, banish it, and they will lose your mind. So I would like to give you a scenario. Outside of the occult, that is literally the same thing. You are sitting in your apartment. Someone busts down your door. They lay down on your couch. And you say, hey, this is my home. And they start sleeping there. And you go, well, I'm not going to make them leave because that's mean. Literally the (laughs) same thing. The only spirits you want in your house are the ones you want there. The Mm -hmm. ones you're invoking. The ones you're working with. Otherwise, why would you want it there? Like, mm-hmm. I don't think you want just random Joe spirit from the road hanging out on your couch forever. Like, you wouldn't let random Joe from the road live on your couch. Banish it. Like, mm-hmm. if you wouldn't let random Joe from the road live on your couch, why are you letting random Joe spirit live on your couch? Like, it, it doesn't make sense. Especially if they're, like, freaking you out. Like, if Joe broke into your home and started threatening you with a knife, you wouldn't be like, well, I'm not going to fight back because that's mean. Bitch, you'd Mm -hmm. get stabbed. Mm -hmm. That's how you die. Like, Mm -hmm. what? And obviously these spirits aren't going to kill you. But, like, Jesus Christ, just banish the fucker. Like, Mm -hmm. bye-bye. Especially if they're breaking shit. Yeah. I I, I do have, I have such an issue. I think that, okay. Uh, I don't know if you want to keep this for the main show. I think that our community has such an issue with niceness that they stop. Like, they think that cleansing is just for you, but cleansing is about your space. It includes banishing, I feel. I know that banishing ends up being that weird category that people are like, I include it in baneful. And I'm like, why? Banishing (laughs) is not baneful. In the Golden Dawn tradition, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, they, and I actually did this. I do this ritual every single day and have done it every single day since I was literally 16, I think. Um, LBRP every night. Banish mm-hmm. every single night. I even did it in Nike's kitchen when Nike's cat was attacking my feet. Yes. And do I think I'm doing baneful magic every day? No. I think this is also a misunderstanding of what banishing is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Because what banishing is, and I'm going to explain what the LBRP is the example, because it's the one that people encounter the most, people are very familiar with it. For those who don't know, the lesser banishing ritual, the pentagram, is a very short ritual. It takes like five minutes. Um, and you call up some archangels around you, they cleanse out your space, and it puts you in the center. So the LBRP, it clears out any unwanted spirits, but it also puts you at the center of your microcosm, putting you at the center of your space to then control it. So it grounds you as the center of your own universe, which is also a feature of this type of ritual. But as well, it kicks out all the sort of grime and gunk around you. Uh, is the LBRP going to get rid of like a super high level spiritual problem that you need like a straight up exorcism for? No, it's not going to do like that level thing. But for most situations, it, it'll it's a good start. If you need more than an LBRP, you got a pretty solid problem on your hands. Um, but start there. It'll clear out most normal things that you'd encounter. It literally, if you want to be a ceremonialist, just do it every night. It takes five minutes. And trust me, when I started doing the LBRP every single day, my spiritual problems reduced a lot. Like a mm -hmm. lot of these like random spirits showing up and breaking shit. I don't have that happen anymore. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen for me. It used to like a lot doesn't happen anymore so do stuff like this it's 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 helpful and it's not like banishing gets rid of like all spirits forever like i had someone tell me they were scared to banish around their altar because they thought it was gonna like mess up their deity candles like no it just puts out what you don't want and Look, you can still I, call things in just i have prayer or do feelings. an invocation it pulls I more think... things back I think banishing, as would go with the word, is a very Saturnian concept that everybody needs. We hear in mundane, regular life, setting boundaries. And I, I was just going to say, yep. work with if if a deity is asking something of you that you are not willing to do, you're allowed to say that's a boundary for me. I'm not going to do it. And you stop working with them or whatever. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to set these boundaries for your own space. I mean, let's let's go with thinking of it in your house. Don't, don't even think of it like a homeless man. Think of it just like as your family. If you are somebody who has grown up with having your own space and having your own room, let's say you have roommates, okay? You're adults. You have roommates. Your room is your room. If mm -hmm. they're trying to be in your room all the time, you're sending them out because it's your room. That is a boundary. They have crossed it. So you're kicking them out of your room. If they keep doing it, maybe you'd kick them out of the apartment itself. Like having the ability to create this boundary for yourself, I think is incredibly healthy. I think that many people can struggle with setting boundaries and this can be a good way to start where if you're setting a spiritual boundary, I don't want unnecessary spirits in my space. I don't want anything except for my gods and, and whatever else you may work with. Anything else has to get out. This is step number one. Learn how to banish things. And if you can learn how to banish things spiritually, you can start that process of learning how to set your boundaries harder in mundane one-on-one -on -one scenarios. Your roommate can get kicked out of your room a little bit easier if you're used to kicking out spirits that you don't want in there. If you wouldn't let your, your roommate walk into your room unannounced and start moving shit around on your desk, you wouldn't want spirits to do the same. So start with the spirits, because sometimes it's easier to work with non-corporeal things to set your boundaries. It's interesting to me how you're saying, like, that you can use, like, banishing spirits as, like, a way to, like, uh, like practice, like, setting boundaries, because, like, that was something that actually happened to me personally. It wasn't so much, like, I mean, it was the act of setting boundaries, but, like, deeper than that, like, there's a lot, um, I'm not sure, like, what words you guys would use, like, to call it in your own practices, but, like, in at least a lot of the spiritualities I've practiced... Um, a big concept is like, uh, this is going to get confusing because we have a thalamite on the show, but like the idea of will, like you have to put your will into like a spell in order to make it work. And like somewhere that I found that quite often was in banishing work because um, like the idea behind it, like you can invoke a deity or like evoke a deity or evoke a spirit or like use the elemental corners or like whatever, like you can use an external source of power to fuel a banishing, but a uh, more common way of doing it is just using your own personal will to do it. And so like uh, the example, that was brought to mind was when I was talking to J. Allen Cross. He he's um uh, what's the word like a ghost hunter basically like a paranormal investigator and so he does exorcisms and like spiritual cleansing on houses all the time and he said a really simple way of banishing a spirit is just to like clap 
but like it's not just like he we, he went into an entire diatribe about this it's not just the act of like clapping that creates the banishing effect it's all of the oomph that like you put into it and like he he had a very eloquent way of explaining this but like it's the force of like your confidence in yourself your confidence in your abilities your need to create like a sacred space around you your conviction behind doing that your belief in the words that you're saying or the actions you're performing like all of that psychological metaphysical energy built up together and you throw all of that into a clap like even that's just enough to banish and so like banishing work in specific like for me um you were talking about it being a good way to practice setting boundaries for me it was a good way to just practice having like self-confidence in general if i'm being honest so like i just thought that was a funny synchronicity but like yeah we're talking about examples like yeah clapping that's like one way that kind of fucked me up in the head when i figured out you could banish a spirit just by clapping but like through learning that i did more research on banishing and some of my favorite ways i've learned since then are like um there's a spell from greek mythology where like you can ring a bell and like that uh, like sends away all the chaotic energy Energies around you so I've started doing that a lot more in like my Hecate rituals for example I was going to go into whenever I traditionally have done banishing work like usually I will just go for the first method that I was talking about where I invoke a deity in order to give me the strength to banish whatever I'm banishing and so within that like I've talked about before Hecate is the main deity I work with and in Greek mythology she's viewed to be um, one of the roles she has is she's basically like a shepherd for lost spirits and like she specifically handles spirits that died violently or spirits that are lost or like like any type of malevolent like we would consider like a poltergeist or something like that she's in the cosmic order responsible for coming in and collecting all of those spirits and shepherding them shepherding them away to the afterlife and so within hecatean systems it's really common to use hecate to banish whatever you need to banish in terms of cleansing i mean i know i already covered it but some of my favorite ways and i've made videos about this so there's certainly more things that i do but um the big ones I do are cleaning the space. Like if I want to cleanse my altar, I'll, I'll take everything off of it and set it off to the side, either on another table or on the floor or something. And then I will like wash it. And I might include uh, maybe like an essential oil or an herb or something in the wash. But I mean, just like soap, like I'll literally use soap and yeah. wipe it down and clean it. Um, usually like a lemon scented soap is an easy one if you want to add the magical correspondence. And then uh, especially if it's wood, so I'll do the regular cleaning and then I'll do a drop or two of essential oil on the top and I'll use that to sort of seal it in and protect it. Uh, and then I'll put the stuff back on, but I, I might like clean the individual items. Like I clean everything. I'll do a deep clean every couple months or so. So like a physical cleaning to, to sort of take off the spiritual gunk with the actual dirt and dust itself. Uh, yeah. Just dust busting sometimes. The other big one I'll do Depending on the weather in the winter, if it's around freezing, maybe I'll do this. If it's any colder, I won't. Um, but like if the weather's nice, I'll open the windows and I'll let a, a fresh breeze come in. So I'll let the air come in and mix it up because when the air in a room is stagnant, it doesn't feel as good. So getting literally fresh air. Um, if I'm talking magically, I like to do smoke bundles myself. I have one that I made myself. It's now gone. I'll have to make another one at some point. Probably next year I'll make a couple. But it was um, lavender, mullein garden sage uh there's one or two other things in there but that those three were like the base of it and i used mm -hmm. that for ages it worked so good i have a cedar bundle that i use so i like this smoke <sighs> cleansing personally because i just work really well with that kind of stuff but you know for the most part i'm not going to do the smoke cleansing unless the rest of my space is good or just picking up my room i mean if i've got laundry on the floor i'm gonna pick up the laundry first and at minimum i'm gonna do that i cleaned up more of my desk today and that already makes me feel better like the the physical cleaning of a room just the picking up is a big big part and in some ways the cleaning slash cleansing of my room is what helps me keep on track spiritually like keeping my space clean keeps me clean spiritually and i tie those two together to help motivate me because that can be harder with adhd so consecration is sort of an interesting turn from these because consecration is a little different than what we've been discussing but it is important to consecrate your tools so when you're going to use a tool for ritual it's important to designate that for its purpose and for the ritual so if you're new you're probably multitasking using your ritual tools for other things in your life like say you use your ritual dagger as like a knife for cooking or something right if that's the case, you need to consecrate it prior to the ritual for that purpose. If you're using, say, a tool for a specific thing all the time, you only really need to consecrate it once, like this crystal ball. 
I use this for scrying. It's small, but it works. Uh, so I don't need to like re-consecrate that all the time. Sometimes I think it's good to cleanse your tools, like just run a little smoke bundle by them or something, but you only need to consecrate once. And basically what you do is there's a bunch of techniques, but you basically just, you take the item, you go, this is its purpose. Um, and if say you're, say you're designating a tool to represent the element of water, you run that underwater and you do a little prayer, like I call to the spirits of water, da 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 da, list, 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 list. And then you set that and you only use that for that thing. So anytime you use a new tool or a tool that you've used for some, some other purpose, you consecrate it again. Uh, yeah, basically it's pretty simple. Um, you can run smoke over things. You can pray over things. Yeah, basically you can set things out on specific days. I know we all know about the moon water thing, right? Yep. Like you make a cup of water and you set it under the full moon and it charges it somehow. I don't get the whole tech language in occultism thing. I don't really like it to be honest. <laughs> really? Um, Oh, I love it. Because I feel like I'm, like, plugging my water into a wall. Like, it feels weird to me. But anyways, <laughs> that is, in a sense, consecration. Um, I never thought of it like that. That's funny. But it is oh essentially gosh. a consecration act. So, yeah, you just basically, like, set the thing. This is what this is for. Like, I will sometimes use veils for specific rituals, but I'll wear them for fashion other times. So I consecrate mm -hmm. it before the ritual. Uh, the best time to do this is, like, once you've grounded and before you actually start invoking anything. So I will consecrate things. I will meditate, dim my lights, get into headspace, then consecrate my stuff and then start whatever I'm planning to do. That's sort of the order I tend to do it in. Some people will consecrate in the middle of a ritual. So like before they say use the big sword for whatever, they'll consecrate the sword like right there. Like I consecrate you in the name of the element of fire and I call upon the whatever, whatever, whatever. Those inserts are going to vary based on your tradition or whatever. Some people will do it like in the middle of a ritual like that. Mm -hmm. um, I like to do things before because I don't like to break like that. I just, it messes with my head. Um, Cause I like to follow a sort of rhythmic structural way of ritual. Um, and then whenever I'm having time, like commuting with the spirits, then I sort of lose the, the structure to it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like you can consecrate in the middle if you really want. I suggest before personally. Um, yeah. Uh, and once, if you're talking about like some tools, you only need to do it once. Some you're probably going to need to do more than once. It's pretty simple. Um, basically just that it's, it's, you probably are consecrating things, but you don't call it consecrating things already. To be honest. Mm-hmm. So, final thoughts. Yes. So, my final thoughts are that spiritual hygiene is really important. And you know what it starts with? Clean your room. That is step one. I'm dead serious. Step one is put your shit up, clean your room, and then get the pretty smoke bundles, make your room smell all nice, do your, your floor washing. That can be part of your physical cleaning. Then you're going to purify. So this is your, I'm giving you a procedure. This is my final thought. So this is a method I'm creating right as I speak. So you are going to clean your fucking room. If you want, you can do a floor wash while you are cleaning your room. Then you are going to take a smoke bundle, burn it, and you can open the window if you want to be a nut about it, because apparently that's like life or death information according to TikTok. Um, <laughs> then you're going to get into your bathtub and you're going to put some nice little herbs in your bath. Then you're going to go and do your ritual. That is your plan. Yes. There you go. <laughs> we Easy, love it. Easy, simple. Easy, Straight crazy, from the grimoire of Georgina. Straight from the grimoire of me talking with no plan but with my end result. Excellent. The grimoire of improv. My final thought is... Don't forget the correspondences are not just limited to ingredients you put in your spell work. Your body and your space also have correspondences. And if your space is messy, mess corresponds to mess. So a messy room means messy spell work. So just remember that your space and your body are an extension of your spell work as well. And if you're not in a good place to do it, you're not going to be in a good place to do anything. So make sure you're taking care of yourself spiritually in every way that that is uh, important to make sure you're ready for your spell work. Because sometimes that is the other reason that spells can go haywire, because you're not in a good space for them. 
And my final thought is going to be uh, spiritual hygiene is, in my opinion, a necessity for your spiritual practice, but it does not have to look the same from person to person. It's going to be completely unique to you and whatever path you're on, whatever energies you have circulating around you, you have to cater your spiritual hygiene to fit that. And so uh, I guess my advice would be have a little bit bit of patience with yourself. Uh, If you need to take care of spiritual hygiene, you might be in a chaotic state of life right now. You might be experiencing chaotic emotions, chaotic psychological phenomena, chaotic spirits around you fucking with you. Like if you have to do spiritual hygiene, it's because something is amiss in your life. So have a little bit of compassion, try to get a little perspective and figure out what specifically that is. And then feel free to use your spirituality to address that because that is why we're here. And patrons, because I had it up ahead of time, and I'm very good. So we're very you, good. We're getting. Yes. We've been good about this for a we while. We have been now. very good about mm-hmm. this. So if you pay ten dollars or more, then you get your name read off. So we get to th- give you a big extra special thanks. So thank you to Amy, Evan, Hamda, Jonah, Lita, a sociology of tarot, Alejandra, Angry Pratt, Anna, Bridget. Oh, I love this person. I always love seeing their name pop up. Doth Nihilus. Dot. Dot Nihilus. Doitsu, Doth. Yeah, Jessica. It's the same. Lee, same as mine, Leo, just a different... Lilith, Marcello, Marshall, <laughs> Mike, MK Scorpio 89, Nauseated, Neon, Nicole, Rowan, The Lady Ghost, and Victoria. Thank you guys so much. You helped keep the show alive. And if you want to enable us, you can join our Patreon, where you get extended <laughs> shows, pre shows, extra shows every Sabbath, allegedly. We're getting better allegedly. about it, okay? I will, I gotta give that the allegedly. And of course, you get your name right off, which is the most exciting benefit of them all. If you want to find me, I'm Georgina Rose, or Dot Darling, D-A-A-T, not the Doth, the other spelling. They're both technically correct transliterations, um, but I like my spelling more. Sorry, Doth Nihilus. You're very cool. You are valid. You are valid. Anyways, you're valid. You can find me on all the platforms. My phone's dead, but I do have a list, but I'm pretty sure. It's Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, Twitch, Patreon. My patrons get extra fun things too. Um, Telegram and TikTok. I think that's it. I'm like 80% sure that's it. Maybe. Let's hope. Yeah, I also... Wait, I was about to say we host this podcast. I was <laughs> sure do. About we sure do host the magic this podcast. Listening to the podcast. Um, do you know we do this podcast called Magnolias you know? and... Ma- <laughs> that's plugging me, you can find me at warrior witch nice nike i was gonna say nicey warrior witch nike warrior basically witch everywhere nicey. and mainly it's twitter instagram youtube and of course i host a podcast it's called magnolias and magic <laughs> um and i am anthony if you want to find me i am at anthony the witch on twitter and on instagram and that is about it and by the way i also host a podcast called magnolias and magic wow amazing (laughs) yeah did you know we're the host of magnolias and magic by the way there's this really cool show called magnolias and magic you should definitely listen to it so (laughs) this has been georgina rose no we already did that one And this has been Magnolias and Magic. There you go.